Alrighty, here's our video on the impacts of overfishing, and it's not as different from what we went over in class as I thought it would be, so it should be pretty similar to the notes that you guys have. So um, this is the main difference. Fishing is less this, which you might visualize. Um, and the fishing we're talking about is more like this. Um, this is commercial fishing, intensive fishing. And so let's talk first about what we use the fish for so we can understand some of the consequences of um, overfishing. And then we'll talk about some of the various techniques that are used uh, for fishing. So the world produces about 200 million tons of fish and seafood per year. This is from a combination of two things, wild fish catch, which is what we're going to talk about in this lesson, and then fish farming, otherwise known as aquaculture, which will be in the next lesson. So global food consumption has been on the rise. Um, and that is probably explainable by, if nothing else, the population increase. However, per capita food fish consumption has also doubled within that time frame. And remember, per capita means per person, literally means per head. So not only do we have more people, each person is eating about double the fish that they used to back in like 1961. Um, so this obviously is going to increase the demand for fish, which is going to relate to how fish populations became overfished. Then um, there are sometimes calls to transition to eating more seafood rather than other meats, just because uh, seafood and meat are both sources of animal protein. But seafood has a lower environmental footprint. It produces less greenhouse gases. It doesn't use as much land, so you don't have to clear land for agriculture. And if you're farming wild fish, or not farming, if you're catching wild fish, it's going to produce less nutrient pollution. However, the levels at which we're currently catching fish are unsustainable. Um, so this is just to look at real quick where uh, people in different countries get most of their protein. So notice there are about five sources of protein on here. You can get protein from plants, meat, eggs, dairy, and then fish and seafood. So fish and seafood is going to be over here at the end. So you'll notice the United States doesn't tend to get a lot of our protein from fish and seafood. We actually, which may surprise you, get a large chunk from plant protein, and then, which shouldn't surprise you, the majority of our protein comes from meat. But if you look at other countries that might have slightly different diets, look at Japan. Japan gets a much larger share of its foot protein from seafood, which makes sense. It's an island nation, and so um, seafood is going to be or would have been traditionally fairly uh, plentiful around the island, but there's limited land space. So you can't use as much land to grow uh, meat because it requires more land because you've got to raise about 10 times the crops or crop mass to support, you know, the same mass of a, uh, a cow or pig or whatever you're looking at. Um, then you have other countries, like if you look at India, for example, where you've got a large part of the population that is primarily vegetarian, um, like the, the Hindus in the population would be, um, you'll see a larger percentage of their protein comes from plant protein, but there are still you know, the bad Hindus like me who eat meat, there are Muslims and Christians and people of other religions or people who aren't religious. Um, and so they might get their, um, they might get their, uh, protein from other sources like meat. Um, and dairy is actually pretty big in India as well, but there is also a small, but not insignificant portion of their protein that comes from, uh, fish and seafood. So first, before you can understand fishing, you need to know where fishing happens. So a fishery is an area where fish are caught. So we'll talk about fisheries throughout. We'll also use another term, the fish stock, and that's the population or part of the population that you're taking fish from. Um, the most commonly caught uh, species or fish currently are anchoveta, Alaskan pollock and skipjack tuna. This, by the way, is a picture of an Alaska pollock. Um, I tried to find a good map with locations of fisheries around the world, and this is kind of the best I could do. It's EU, so European Union catches. Um, so, for example, here in the Middle Atlantic, you see skipjack tuna. Up here, you see redfish like cod and 
Uh, you see redfish, then some cod and some halibut. Up here in the north, you have herring. Um, over here in the Indian Ocean, you have skipjack tuna, yellowfin tuna, big eye tuna. So that just kind of gives you an, an idea of where these different species are, are caught. There's, of course, lots of fishing in the Pacific, but like I said, this is mostly from the European Union, and Europe it borders the Atlantic Ocean, so they'll tend to use the Atlantic Ocean a little more. An important thing to note when you're looking at how fish stocks will end up uh, re being replenished after you fish from them is the recruitment, and that is the entry of juvenile fish into the fish stock. This represents reproductive potential because as you have juveniles maturing, then they will soon be able to reproduce and add to the population. And then in places where you have water that's um, not international waters, but owned by, uh, technically owned by a country, you can have a legal limit set to the amount of fish that you can take from a catch. So, I mean, from a stock. So that's your total allowable catch. The problem is, I think it's about 200 miles off the coast. You uh, no longer have ocean that's claimed by a particular country. And so international waters are not owned and are not monitored or policed by a particular country, which means you're going to be more prone to tragedy of the commons out there because it's a common resource. And so people don't have any control of or regulation of how much they're catching. So they're going for big profit or they're going for, you know, maximal catch at that point. Um, so this is by country, um, how many millions of tons that country caught uh, of wild fish. So notice, it looks like the biggest fisher is going to be China. Uh, China not only feeds its substantial population of over a billion people with the fish, and fish may make up a larger part of the diet, especially on the seacoast. Um, coastal cities, coastal areas tend to consume more seafood just because it's plentifully available. Um, but they also produce and package fish for export as well. Um, the United States, Mexico, Russia, uh, Chile, um, Norway, those tend to be also countries that are producing, are catching a lot of fish. So this is not to do with fish farming. This is totally wild catch. So let's look at how we do fishing, especially ex intensive fishing that, um, is, you know, commercialized, etc. So you can have long line fishing where you just trail a bunch of lines with baited hooks attached behind you in the water. Um, and then you'll have like floaties, which will help keep it closer to the surface. So that way you can more easily drag it in instead of trying to drag it from the depths. Um, you know, on each of these techniques, I'll have the major types of fish that are caught with it. I'll let you guys read that. What we're going to talk about is the fact that um, there are dangers to this. So sea turtles, some whales, dolphins, and what's not mentioned here, seabirds, can end up getting caught in this as well. And we'll talk about what we call unintended catch. But that can decrease natural populations. And then you don't harvest those. Um, and so they end up being waste. They end up, you know, dying and not for a purpose. So that produces a negative impact on the ecosystem. Purse sign fishing is you take a large net. Whoa. My bad. Purse sign fishing is you take a large net, you put it around the fish school or the fish group that you want to catch, and then you draw like almost a drawstring. And so you're pulling and that draws the net closed so that the fish can't escape out the top. And then you haul it onto the boat. This happens while the boat is stationary. Because you're trying to target a particular school. That school is usually like a cluster that's not really moving around a lot. I mean, they're moving around within the cluster, not really outside of the cluster. Um, and so it's like, it says here, used for dense schools of single fish species. So when fish are schooling together, basically. Trawling is, this boat in trawling is moving. You're dragging a net through the water. 
Um, and so you pull the net through the water, it catches fish, they can't escape. And then eventually when your net is full, you can pull it up. Now I wanted to, to differentiate between the type of trawling in the open ocean and bottom trawling. Bottom trawling can be particularly damaging because it can damage the seabed and some of the organisms that live on the seabed. So for example, you'll have, you know, coral reefs out here. That's not supposed to be algae, that's supposed to be coral. Um, and then when you're dragging this net along, it basically scrapes up fish from the bottom, but it can also damage coral and other structures on the seabed. So this type of fishing can be particularly dangerous to the ecosystem that's left behind. Um, this uh, is used to catch various organisms, including shrimp. And I'm emphasizing shrimp because we're going to talk about the negative impacts of shrimp farming a little later. So some of the tools that are used to help fish, um, there are these massive factory ships or fish processing vessels that are large, they've got a lot of automation, and they are capable of not only catching the fish, but they can process them, so debone them, take off the scales, get them into fish fillets, and freeze them and ready them for packaging, so that once they uh, end up reaching shore, they just have to offload what they've already processed and stick it in a box, ship it off. Um, these types of ships are like 60 to 70 meters in length, so they're big. And uh, they can process the fish they catch into fillets and get them ready for freezing within a few hours. And then these guys can be out to sea for up to like, you know, a month and a half, two months. So they can catch a large number of fish and get them ready for processing. So for example, I included this picture because it has an image showing you this is the factory and this is where the processing happens. Uh, then a lot of some fishing companies may use spotter planes. So somebody takes a plane, drives it over the waters where you think your fish might be, and looks for signs of schools of fish. So these are all birds, but seabirds will tend to congregate where there's uh, plenty of food. So that can be where there's a lot of fish. And so where you see a lot of birds kind of congregating over the open ocean and diving down, that's where they're going there and they're catching fish. And so then they can radio it into a fishing vessel, which can then come into the area and it can catch those fish instead. And then sonar is often used to detect objects underwater. You've probably seen it when uh, you've watched movies and they have like submarines and uh, they'll be looking on the, the display for like an enemy vessel or something like that. What happens is you detect objects underwater by letting out sound waves and then waiting for them to be echoed back to you. And the time it takes for them to echo back can help indicate, okay, when it hits an object, so you let out a sound wave, it hits an object, then it bounces back to the ship. And when you detect it at the ship, you can kind of uh, use that to calculate how far away something is. So it can be used to detect schools of fish deeper underwater. Uh, it lets you detect things like how they're distributed. Are they closely packed or are they uh, less densely packed? And then also what direction they're moving. So all of this allows us to target fish with a lot more ease. This is very different from traditional fishing methods where, you know, you're just out there. Uh, you may know where the fish tend to congregate and you may take a net out there, but there are days when, you know, you might not catch very much because you're in the wrong area. Um, and so this all improves fishing efficiency, which means we can take more and more. So what are the actual impacts of overfishing since that's the title of our uh, notes? Well, the biggest impact is fishery collapse. So what happens is the population reaches a level at which the fish stock just can't recover. We've caught too many fish. There is not enough to sustain the population. The population has a massive crash, and then we're no longer able to catch fresh fish from it. Um, so 
from 1974 to 2017, the proportion of fish, the fish stocks that were biologically sustainable, meaning those stocks had not collapsed and we are able to keep using them, decreased from about 90% to about, you know, less than 70%. So these are the sustainable, sustainably fish stocks. These are the ones that are overexploited and these are the ones where the fisheries have collapsed. And there are a couple of big examples of that. For example, cod in the northern Atlantic. So this is showing the approximate catch of cad, uh, cod sorry, uh, off the coast of Canada from about 1500 to about 2019. So it's almost, it's like 500 years worth of data. So you can see that catches were steadily increasing. And then they increased exponentially at this point. And at that point, this is where the stock collapsed. Then the fishermen gave it a little time to recover, and when it looked like it was recovering, they started catching fish again. So this was the dip, and this was less fish to catch. They kept catching fish, and now the fish stock has collapsed to the point where they're really not bringing in very much at all. And honestly, from an ecological standpoint, they should just stop catching cod there and let whatever fish are there build up the population for a few decades. But this is an example of a fish collapse. Um, so there, for example, is the collapse right there. Another problem with uh, overfishing is something called bycatch. So uh, when you're fishing, you will generally pull the fish up They'll be on the deck of your boat, and it may take some time to sort them. In the meantime, whatever you've pulled up can't breathe out of the water, and a lot of times it ends up dying. If you don't have uh, specific measures in place, you can catch a number of species you weren't trying to catch. So, for example, you could catch other fish. Uh, you could catch dolphins, which we tend not to, to fish for. Whales, which their populations were... Um, dramatically decreased by centuries of whaling, and so we're trying to mostly not fish those sea turtles, many of which species can be endangered, and seabirds that become hooked in the fishing gear or caught by a net. So between 30 and 40 percent of all the material we catch in the ocean is bycatch, and the highest rates by far are associated with tropical fish trawling because they are basically taking fish, which are bottom feeders, from the, the seabed. And that damages all the other areas that are on the seabed, including things like coral reefs, and it catches other fish. One of the problems with bycatch is, especially if it's a species you aren't supposed to catch, the fishermen will usually just toss them overboard a lot of times. And so they often die. Um, the few uh, species that don't die may be like shellfish, like clams, mollusks, um, but fish, dolphins, any of those that get caught would end up dying. Um, this is a problem because if some of the fish you're catching are some of the overfish stocks that you're trying not to catch and not to affect the population, then that can slow your rebuilding of the stock. It can endanger protected species that we're trying to conserve, and then it can damage uh, important fish habitats as well as coral reefs as well. And coral reefs are built over dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of generations. So when they're damaged, it takes a long time for that damage to be remediated or mitigated or undone. Um, and so there are some methods that you can use to reduce bycatch. Um, you can use nets with larger holes. So instead of having a net that's like this, you could have a net that's like this. The larger holes will allow smaller fish to escape, so you're not catching as many juveniles. Um, you can tailor that to the size of the species you're trying to catch. And there are numerous bycatch reduction devices. Um, this isn't as big a part of your notes or your exam, so I, I didn't want to go into detail, but you can research that if you're interested. Some other ecological impacts um, that uh, it has a major impact on biodiversity and aquatic ecosystems. So um, between the 1800s and now, the fish and marine mammal biomass in the ocean has decreased by about 60%. And about a third of the species of sharks and rays, this includes like stingrays, uh, devil rays, manta rays, um, you know, a third of those species are being driven towards extinction. 
Um, a really big problem of this is bycatch, um, because you're just catching indiscriminately. Um, bottom trawling is a big deal, especially in deep ocean habitats. So the deep ocean habitats, if you've ever watched Planet Earth or Blue Planet, um, these things depend on waste falling from the surface. They are ecosystems that don't have a regular dependable input of energy from like the sun because they're too deep for photosynthesis to happen. And so the organisms that live in the deep sea floor are adapted to a very slow way of life. They grow slowly, they mature slowly, their populations grow slowly, and any damage that's done to those ecosystems could take instead of decades to recover, could take centuries to recover. Also, when you're catching fish, that can be a form of artificial selection and change the remaining population of fish. So, for example, um, after centuries of fishing, if you always take the biggest fish, then uh, the fish that remain behind to reproduce are the smaller fish. So over time, the size of each individual fish can decrease, can have impacts on the reproductive cycle, the age at which they mature. So fish that mature more quickly may be selected for because they get a chance to reproduce before they get caught. Um, and then, you know, when we're catching large groups of fish, we don't think about the fact that we're taking food from another organism. So it can disrupt the food web and it can reduce the populations of other marine animals, which can impact species that we are trying to, um, trying to preserve, like sea turtles and various corals. So here's uh, another, just a diagram showing you uh, some of the ecological impacts. So for example, um, seashore habitats, especially in coral reefs, tend to be nurseries for many species of fish. Remember in Finding Nemo, they were raising their fishy, their fishy babies in a coral reef. So if you catch these fish, you are reducing the ability of that population to replenish. Um, any sort of waste you know, nets, lines, cages left behind, etc., that ends up on the floor can damage reefs. Um, if you don't use selective gear, uh, selective equipment, um, using just general nets or traps, you could remove a lot of herbivorous fishes that are not your target. And these guys actually eat algae. Without them, you could have an algal bloom, which is the algae population grows out of control, and that causes uh, eutrophication, which we'll talk about in another set of notes. Um, and then some fish will gather in schools to spawn. That is when they release their sperm and eggs in the water. And that's going to be the time of year when they are reproducing. Um, unfortunately, that leaves them vulnerable to being preyed on by these large commercial fishing vessels, which may then take, you know, some nice reproducing members of the population out of it. Um, and then taking large fish. Large fish may be more likely to produce uh, young with a greater chance of survival, so taking those away reduces the reproductive potential of whoever's left. Um, there are socioeconomic impacts as well. Throughout the world, there are a lot of people who depend on fishing for their food source as well as their income source. Um, so food scarcity and loss of employment could affect almost 2.6 billion peoples living in coastal communities and developing nations that depend on seafood. Um, there's an estimate that around 60 million people work in the fishing industry. So if there are no more fish to catch, they lose their job. So how can we make fishing more sustainable? Well, there's something called a maximum, maximum sustainable yield. That is the largest amount of fish that you can catch without having the population crash or decline. That's kind of the sweet spot. That is the goal. Um, although if you catch less than the maximum sustainable yield, you could theoretically see an increase in fish population. Um, this means you can't catch every single fish out there. You have to leave some behind because you have to have somebody left behind to reproduce. If you start catching above the sustainable limit, then that's going to cause depletion of your stock and ultimately a crash. So we can um, use a couple of terms to describe the different uh, 
categories of fish, overfished populations, or overexploited populations, another term for it. We catch the fish faster than they can reproduce. The populations decline, stocks become depleted, can collapse. This is unsustainable. Um, this, like I say, is the sweet spot. So maximally sustainably fished or fully exploited or fully fished are where we catch at the maximum sustainable yield so that we don't see a decrease in population. And then underfished populations, we're catching less than the reproduction rate. So these are species that we could actually increase our fishing of without having the fish populations decline. We just have to be careful that if we move from the overfished species and populations to trying to fish from the underfished populations, that we don't end up overfishing those. So it's a good idea to start fishing if you're fishing a new species or ramping up a new population, fishing of a new population, that you don't go above that maximum sustainable yield. Uh, a few things you can do to make fishing more sustainable, like set the catch limits well below the maximum sustainable yield. You can allow um, consumers to have a voice. This is voting with your dollar. Um, and if sustainably harvested fish are labeled, then people can say, okay, I want to make sure I'm supporting this. I'll only buy fish that's been sustainably harvested. You can also, as a government, print fund importation of fish that hasn't been harvested sustainably, which would require um, knowing that what you know, what fish is harvested unsustainably. You could eliminate government subsidies for commercial fishing, especially like deep ocean fishing, which because of the fuel costs of getting boats out there and getting them back is actually not profitable unless the government is subsidizing it for the most part. So if the government stopped subsidizing it, those companies wouldn't be able to stay in business. So there'd be less deep ocean fishing. Um, you could charge fees for catching anything in public waters. You could increase the number of marine sanctuaries and no fishing areas and increase penalties for fishing techniques that don't allow bycatch to escape, thereby decreasing the number of intentional organisms that we're catching and not using. All right, so the next topic is going to be aquaculture. 